the cursor does not work when I'm in a slideshow. So I'll try to describe if I want to point to something. So uh, you'll notice the dates of this trip was February 15th through 22nd, 2020. So that was kind of the last trip before everything shut down. I thought I would tell you a little bit about monarch butterflies first before I tell you about the trip. So this is the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. Each female lays up to 400 eggs, not all at once because there wouldn't be enough food for the caterpillars. Um, the caterpillars hatch out of these eggs and they're full grown in about 10 to 14 days. Then they pupate and make a chrysalis and that stage is another 10 to 14 days. The adult is ready to fly once its wings are dry about an hour after emerging. And the adult lives about three weeks or so. And so the whole cycle is a little over a month. And this shows you the uh, different generations. Each generation we said lives a little more than a month, except for the fourth or sometimes the fifth generation if they breed again. Uh, and the last generation lives five or six months. That's the one that's in Mexico, can even live as long as eight months. And because it lives so long, some people call it the Methuselah generation. So the I was impressed to learn that the butterflies in Mexico have never been there before and don't breed there either. Um, they just stay there for the winter. And there are a few other monarchs that, particularly the ones west of the Rocky Mountains that overwinter along the coast of California, particularly in the uh, Monterey area. There might be a few Eastern monarchs that overwinter in Southern Florida. They're not sure if they actually stay there or they're just passing through and fly over the Gulf of Mexico. But nearly all the migrating monarchs uh, that are overwintering in Mexico come from Canada, uh, Southern Canada and the Eastern United States, east of the Rockies. And they travel as far as 3000 miles to get to the highlands of Mexico. So they come from all these different areas and they wind up in that one part of Mexico. Um, the summer range you can see goes up a little bit into Canada, but the, the, the summer range is limited by where milkweed grows. Take hmm. notes, remember that milkweed's important. Um, they know when to migrate because the days get shorter, the temperature drops, and the milkweed starts dying. And they return every year to the same forest in Mexico on November 1st, more or less November 1st, which is some of you may recognize as the Day of the Dead. The day after Halloween is a big holiday in Mexico. And the rumor or the legend is that the butterflies represent the souls of the, of the dead, of the family members returning to Mexico. So they go back to the same forest that their great, great grandparents left in the spring. Uh, in the central highlands, there are 12 sanctuaries and usually five of them are open to the public. Uh, and they are attracted to these forests because it's the perfect microclimate for them. The trees there are called Oyamel fir trees. They have just the right temperature and humidity and the trees protect them from the weather, from the wind. We don't know exactly how they found these trees in the first place, but apparently some of this is encoded in their DNA. Uh, maybe they recognize the scales that have been shed in the past and they can smell the right tree or the right forest. And then they also are thought to use magnetism. They have light dependent magnetic compasses embedded at the base of their wings, presumably from ingesting magnetite 
in the milkweed. Um, and this magnetic compass may be attracted to this area because it's a mining area. There are metals there. So what do they do while they're in Mexico? They don't do much. They mostly rest for five months and save their energy. They do wake up occasionally, particularly when it gets warmer. And we went towards the end of February. That's when they start waking up more, particularly when the sun shines on them. And they fly around to cool off, but they don't want to fly too much because they use up energy. And they do look for water occasionally nectar, but most of them don't eat. And then just before they leave or just after they leave, March or April is when they breed. The number varies from year to year and they measure by the area that's covered by these trees. They can estimate how many million colonies there are by how many acres or hectares. Hectare is about two and a half acres. Uh, so you can see that generally the number is going down and the winter I was there was 2019 to 20, which is the next to last one on there and it's lower this winter. So people want to know, well, are they endangered? Officially, they are not endangered, even though the numbers are trending down. Now, the ones on the West Coast are really endangered, but not officially. They, this year they counted only about 2,000 where they used to have millions. Uh, and to, the reason they're not officially endangered is because you have to apply to get on the endangered list or the threatened list. And they are on the list of being considered, but there are other species that are more endangered. So they're due to look at this list again in 2024. Uh, they, they are threatened in Mexico by illegal logging and climate change. Um, most of the illegal lobbying, logging has stopped because the locals have learned that ecotourism pays better. Um, there are still drug cartels active in the area occasionally. They want the land, they want the trees, but usually they only take out one tree at a time, which is still bad because it leaves holes. So as far as climate change, they can go higher, but at some point they're gonna run out of trees if they go much higher. Um, and uh, actually my trip two weeks before we left, they sent out a, a notice that we could cancel the trip if we wanted to. Now, you know, you might say, oh, well, that was because of COVID. No, this is before COVID. There were two murders in the uh, uh, sanctuaries. One was a, a, an ecologist and one was a guide and uh, nobody knew who murdered them, but I think they eventually decided it was some sort of personal matter and not drug related, although that's what they told us. Anyway, some people that were supposed to be on my trip did cancel, but we said, ah, eh, you know, they say it's safe, we'll go. So I said the butterflies are not endangered, but the milkweed is endangered. And the milkweed leaves are the only food source for the caterpillars. So no milkweed, no caterpillars, no butterflies. The uh, milkweed plants are disappearing because of herbicides used mostly by like big farms. And then in addition, insecticides and pesticides will kill the butterflies and the caterpillars. So what can you do? What can anybody do? Don't use pesticides, insecticides, or herbicides. And this is one more reason to buy organic. And then the other thing you can do is plant milkweed, especially milkweed that's native to the area because that's what the caterpillars in this area like. Uh, and there are 11 species of milkweed native to Pennsylvania. I'm going to show you the three most common. Milkweed, interestingly, contains cardiac glycosides, similar to foxglove. So it's toxic to birds and mammals. So um, it should survive if 
we weren't trying to kill it. Um, the butterflies and caterpillars might be toxic as well from eating the milkweed, or at least they taste bad, which protects them so that predators don't eat them. Um, there are some butterflies that look a lot like monarchs. They disguise themselves so that predators think they're monarchs and won't eat them either. So this is the common milkweed um, and it's probably the most common and it's about oh, three or four feet tall or so. And milkweed tends to like wet areas. This is swamp milkweed. Some of them have pink flowers, some of them have white flowers, some of them have pink and white flowers. And then this is butterfly weed, which also attracts all kinds of butterflies. And this one is orange. So I have planted all of these and most of them die. And I'm not sure if something else is eating them, but uh, they're starting to survive. So I must be doing a better job. The caterpillars have voracious appetites, but the only thing they eat is the leaves. So they will strip the plants. And there are these other, if you see in the picture on the right, there are these little orange aphids that also eat the plants. So enough about the butterfly story. And now I'll tell you more about my trip. We went, I went with a friend, we went two days early to acclimate to the altitude. Mexico City is over 7,000 feet and where the butterfly sanctuaries are is over 10,000 feet. So after we arrived in Mexico City the first day, we went to Chapultepec Park on our own. And then we took a pre-trip excursion to visit the pyramids of Teotihuacan. And then the next day, the trip officially started and we drove to Angangueo, which is this little town that welcomes butterfly watchers. Um, and uh, we visited El Rosario Butterfly Sanctuary that afternoon. The following morning, we went to Chinqua Butterfly Sanctuary. And then in the afternoon, we took a tour of the town. The next morning, we visited El Rosario again. So we went three different times. We had an afternoon visit, a late morning visit, and an earlier morning visit. And then we drove after that to Avondaro, which is a resort on a lake, and the town near there is Valle de Bravo. We stopped in Toluca on the way back to Mexico City, and then we came home from Mexico City. Hmm. This is the uh, Museum of Anthropology, which is world famous in Chapultepec Park. And the day we went, I think it was, I think it was a Saturday or Sunday. It was free for Mexicans, but tourists had to pay. So, but it wasn't very expensive. And it's a beautiful museum. This is a view from the inside, from the upper level. Um, the first floor is mostly archaeology, and the second floor is anthropology and culture. And uh, as you can see, it was pretty crowded. It was also nice weather. So these are some of the things on the first floor. So this took up the whole wall. And uh, you may have seen these Olmec heads that were found in southeastern Mexico. So they have one of them there. I was trying to get a picture of the head without anybody in the picture, but there was a line of kids who wanted their picture taken. So you can see how big the head is. Hmm. Then we walked to the zoo, which was not too far. And uh, this is a the only bear native to South America called the spectacle bear. And then um, this is one of the few birds I saw. This is a green winged macaw, and there were a pair there that were watching us. The next day we went to Teotihuacan. There were supposed to be six of us on that trip, but four of them were part of the group that didn't show up. So my friend and I had a private tour. Um, 
the pyramid in the front is the pyramid of the sun, the one further away is the pyramid of the moon, and the road between them is the street of the dead. And the ants that are crawling all over it are people. So of course we climbed it also. Um, and it was kind of warm and it's steeper than it looks or maybe it looks steep. Uh, and this is the view from the top. This is from the classic period, which is about a thousand years before the Aztecs, although they named it. And uh, the ruins are, some are residential and some are offices. And uh, there were things underneath the pyramids also, tunnels and things. And then this is the pyramid of the moon, but you couldn't get past the halfway point because of construction, uh, reconstruction. So we did not climb the pyramid of the moon. And here's B coming down the pyramid of the sun and they put nicely put cables there that you can hold on to because the steps are steep. Halfway about between there's a area called the patio of the pillars that has been reconstructed and you can see that the stones are different colors. So some of them are the original and some are replacement stones. And I was trying to get birds into this talk. So there's a parrot design. And then that night we had an orientation dinner and this shows the route. So if you look on the right, that's our hotel, the Camino Real Polanco, where actually I stayed 48 years before, I think, or thereabouts 1971. Uh, when my husband and I went to Mexico City. So it's the same hotel. Um, and we went from there, um, mostly west and a little bit north to Angangueo. And the map at the bottom shows more or less where the mountains are in Mexico. And they gave us a slideshow and told us about the butterflies. So we learned to tell the males from the females because the males have thinner veins and they have these two black dots on their lower wings. So how to get there, we checked into our motel in Angangueo, which I think was about a three or four hour drive from Mexico City. And then we boarded pickup trucks with seats in the back. And then they took us to a part ways up the mountain. And then we went on horseback for another half an hour or so. And then uh, we went on foot the last 20 or 30 minutes till we got to the, uh, the pine forests. And this is the entrance to the sanctuary, which says it's, it's the best in the world, the biggest in the world. It's a pretty big butterfly too. Uh, and we arrived at the sanctuary in the afternoon and followed the path and the signs. Guides come in in the morning and they find the roosts and then they mark off the path that you can take that day because they move around and they don't want you too close to them, but there were butterflies everywhere. So we kept wanting to take, this was a, a photo tour. So we kept wanting to take pictures and the guides, our guides kept saying, no, no, we've got to get to the trees. So we kept going and then we got to the trees. So you look at these trees and everything that's orange, mm -hmm. that looks like leaves, those are butterflies. They were just dripping off the branches. Butterflies everywhere and we just kept looking at them and then taking pictures and then looking at them. And uh, it really is amazing. There are, I don't know how many there are, but I would say there's millions of them. Like this cluster here might be a thousand right there. Mm. And mm. then uh, they were silhouetted on the tree trunks, hanging off the branches. And then there were some flowers and some of them were on the flowers. So uh, we started taking pictures on the flowers, looking for artistic shots. There were some dead butterflies, but 
I think this is a very small percentage and I'm not sure what kills them, but these two here, at first we thought they were mating, but if you look, they both have black dots. So they're two males. So we think they're fighting. So maybe the others that was found dead were fighting, but obviously the vast majority survived so that they can go back. Um, we started taking pictures in the sky. And Shirley, pictures. Yes. Can I interrupt? It's Donna. Um, we have one person said, oh, wow. And another person uh, uh, asked if you can point out a, a little bit closer, which are the white spots to identify a male butterfly? Uh, they're black spots. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the spots. Um, I can't point, but let me see. Or describe it. You said they they're were on the back wings near the bottom. There is a black spot on the there. You can see on the one on the slide on the right. The the one that swings are are open. I'll try to find a better one. I might be able, let me see if I can go back. Okay, look, you see the black spots near the base of these wings? So it's it's really kind of a wide area in the veins. Um, these have, most of these have black spots too, but not, you can't see it on all of them. I hope that helps. Then we went down the hill. We we took uh, we walked down from El Rosario, and then we stopped in the truck. We stopped at sunset and looked out, and the town was out there with lights, and they gave us drinks. This okay. Now this is the next day. This is our motel. You can see more butterflies. Um, and uh, it's also on a hill, so you can see it's hilly. And the towel on the bed was shaped like a butterfly. The next day we went to a different sanctuary. This is Sierra Chinqua. And there were some signs and maps and it, it shows the general area of where the uh, sanctuaries are. So El Rosario is about three quarters of the way up and Sierra Chinqua is the one at the top. Um, we do not go to the others. I think um, they're probably all similar. Um, Sierra Chinqua is steeper. So we rode horses both up and down. And, you know, you could say, oh, you know, I don't ride horses. Well, they helped us get on the horse. I needed lots of help. Um, and then we didn't have to do anything except stay on the horse. Uh, we each, each horse had its own caballero, which is a cowboy leading the horse. And in fact, some of them helped carry stuff for us too. So um, it really wasn't hard. It was easier than walking. Um, I don't see any black spots on these butterflies. So I don't know if you can compare to the difference. Um, anyway, these butterflies, so them, remember this was a photo trip. So we practiced taking pictures of them flying and landing and on the flowers and in the sky and on the trees. And uh, we practiced videos with our phones. Uh, we practiced slow-mo and there's gonna be a movie later. So you'll see some of that. And then here I am <clears throat> on the far left coming back. Now, interesting, they gave us these, these uh, neck gaiters to cover our faces. And I told you this before COVID. So they weren't really meant 
to stop germs, they were to stop dust. But it, it wasn't that dusty. On the way back to town, we stopped to see the axolotl, which sounds like some mythical creature, but it's actually an endangered salamander. But I've never seen a salamander that was 10 inches long. So they're like some sort of prehistoric salamander. Hmm. Then we went to the town and we walked around the town, which is very colorful. And you can see uh, butterflies on the, not real butterflies, but are big butterflies on the telephone poles. And this was a mining town and there were disasters, there were collapses, and they, then the town fell on hard times. And then people knew the butterflies were there, but somebody quote, discovered them and they decided, oh, tourists would come for this. So for five or six months out of the year, butterflies dominate the economy. And then the rest of the year, if you want to work, you have to leave town pretty much. There were some uh, two pretty churches and then there's a mural in the middle of town that the group I went with was Natural Habitat Adventures and they helped restore this uh, mural. And the picture in the middle the guy painting the butterflies is the guy who painted the mural. That's a self-portrait. And there are 13 butterflies there because he had 13 children. So they represent his children. And on the left, you see the mine in the mural. And on the right, they're celebrating butterflies. Mm -hmm. The next morning, before we went back to El Rosario, um, we stopped at a, a viewpoint above the town to take panoramic views. And it's, you know, it's a very quaint, pretty little town. And then we kept saying, are we gonna see the butterflies clustered on the tree trunks? And the guides kept saying, don't worry, don't worry. Cause we thought, you know, we're wasting time. We wanna get up there. But they knew that there's a good time to get there. So there were butterflies all over the trees. And it almost looks like they're part of the tree trunk. And then you mm. see little bits of orange. And then as it gets sunnier, you see more orange. And then more orange. Mm. And these are just, you know, there's thousands of butterflies in each picture here, which is, it was just amazing. and you know, more and more butterflies. And then while we were watching the butterflies, somebody said, no, no, let's go this way now. So oh, there's that one in the middle there, see the black dots mm -hmm. on the back wings? Mm -hmm. So you can tell and there's a couple others. So that's a good view of a male. And the ones without the black dots, the, the veins are slightly wider mm -hmm. and those are the females. Mm -hmm. Hey, Shirley, it's Donna. Can I ask you a question? Uh-huh. Um, so the butterflies that are apparently colorless, is that a reflection or is that um, no, like that's, the outside that, of their wings? That's the underside of their wings. They're sort of grayish or tan. So that's the, that's the, the, the bottom of their wings when their wings are closed. Okay, thanks. So we moved down the hill a little bit and where there was some water and there were butterflies fluttering around and looking for water in the dirt. And there was a river of butterflies. It wasn't very wet, but they, they found water. Unfortunately, some of them drowned Okay, now see that one's a male with the black mm -hmm. dot. Mm -hmm. And the one on the left is a female. Mm -hmm. 
And then we had to say goodbye. Thank you for your visit. And that was the end of the butterflies for that trip. But uh, we did see some of the other tourism in the area. We went to uh, Avandaro as a resort on a lake and there were hummingbirds on this bougainvillea and mm. we each had these little cabins, but I couldn't get pictures of them. It was too late in the day, but we each, the place was beautiful. Um, has golf and swimming, but it was winter time. So it wasn't quite warm enough for that. Then we went on a walk the next morning and the guide told me this was a white-eyed vireo. And I came home and I showed this picture to John. I said, I think this is a Nashville warbler. So it's a Nashville warbler. And this is the Velo de Novia waterfall, which means bridal veil. So every place seems to have a bridal veil falls. And then we went for a walk in the town of Valle de Bravo. And the first place we went was the cemetery where these great egrets were roosting in the trees. Hmm. I told you I would get birds into this. <laughs> this was outside a house along the main street. So I don't know whether they were selling these or these were all pets, but more birds. And I guess chickens are birds too. So we don't usually see chickens with their heads still on. And the, the chicken breast is pechuga. And that's about $2.20 a pound. Then we moved on to the next town on the way back to Mexico City. This is Toluca. And Toluca had this city market, like a big train station kind of. And um, they closed the market in 1975 and they asked for ideas on what to do with the building. And Leopoldo Flores designed gardens and stained glass windows and completed this called Cosmo Vitrol Botanical Garden, which is man's relationship to the universe. So there are 71 of these stained glass windows going around the building, which I think you'll see more in the movie. So then we went back to Mexico City. We stopped in the suburbs for dinner, complete with a mariachi band. And then we went back to our hotel and off to the airport. And uh, we, uh, uh, saw newspaper articles and all the personnel, the uh, TSA and the ticket takers and all were wearing masks, but no one else was. So that was our, our warning. Okay, stay tuned for the movie. Um, hopefully I can figure out how this will work. Mm. Yes. Okay. All right, now it will play and I'll stop talking. Dog 
followed us.